Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ASSC presentation on service opportunities. We have a really good program today. Um, two representatives from Children's Hospital are here to talk to us about the Snowplow program and also internship volunteer opportunities at Children's Hospital. Um, Mary Kraft is a certified child life specialist with degrees in elementary education and an early childhood endorsement from Wayne State University. She's worked at Children's Hospital of Michigan for the past 15 years, and currently she works in cardiology pediatric intensive care unit. She's part of a palliative care team and the critical incident stress management team. She helps children and families adjust to hospitalization by increasing normalization and coping. Our other presenter is Deanna Scanlon. She's also an alum. She's a certified therapeutic recreation specialist. She has worked at the Children's Hospital of Michigan for 18 years. Ten of those were spent as a CTRS on the rehabilitation unit. In the last eight years, she has been part of the child life development, child life department, in charge of special events and donations for the hospital. So uh, we are here today for two reasons, to talk about service opportunities, which are all important, um, not only for just being good people, but for also for when we go up for selective salary and for our um, reviews, promotions, ESS, that kind of thing. Service, as we all know, is, is a part of our commitment to the university. Um, so we, the latter part of the program, Dennis Best, is going to talk about different types of service opportunities that we can take advantage of. Um, and we're going to start off the program with Deanna and Mary giving us information about the Snowplow program and opportunities for internships and volunteering at Children's Hospital of Michigan. One thing I want to note, we are here collectively as a group of academic staff, and part of the goal of today is to get all of us to go to our faculty and friends. We are going to, at some point later, Cheryl's going to pass around a list of donation that the Children's Hospital is looking for, toys, gift cards, that kind of thing. And we're hoping to raise as much as possible. Deanna will be able to explain to you what the purpose of raising these, uh, getting these to them. The deadline will be December 11th, and Cheryl will talk more about that at the end of the program. Thanks for coming. Hi, I'm Deanna Scanlon from Children's Hospital of Michigan. Um, we're, we're part of the Child Life Services Department. Um, and we uh, think we humanize the healthcare experience through support, information, and play for the kids. Um, this is our child life team. We, we are um, a bunch, there's a, a large group of us. This was just Halloween, <laughs> um, our most recent picture of our staff. But we have a manager. We have 10 child life specialists on staff, a music therapist, an art therapist, a child, two child life fellows. I'm the child life project specialist in charge of donations and special events. Um, we have three child life assistants, we have a hospital school teacher, um, and internship students, we usually take two, and we have a practicum student right now as well. We also have um, a school teacher from the Detroit Public Schools that works in our department, but she is an employee of the Detroit Public Schools. Um, so it takes all of us to run Snowpile and um, other events in the hospital, so that's why we wanted to introduce you to our team. We're going to give you a little bit about what our whole overall goal as a department is. So through play, art, music, and special events and learning, we use child-friendly tools to reduce stress and anxiety um, experienced during hospitalization, increase positive coping skills for the children and their families, and foster normal growth and development um, during hospitalization. So um, we all play a little bit of a different role in, in that. Um, the child life specialists work one-on-one -on -one with the, the patients, um, and Mary's going to talk a little bit more about that um, when we get to the child life specialist. Um, my part is the events and um, donations and things, and I kind of fall under that normalization umbrella because kids shouldn't be in the hospital. Right. They should be home in school, healthy, feeling well. So um, with events and donations and toys and things like that, I bring normalization. I try to bring normalization to the hospital because the kids should be playing. They should be passing along Valentine's. They should be trick-or-treating at Halloween. Um, they should be, you know, maybe receiving gifts at whatever holiday it is in, in December that they celebrate. So um, that's my piece in it. Um, Mary's going to talk to you a little bit more about um, just a few of the other people in our department. So 
we offer um, school services. We actually have a, a classroom set up four days a week in the morning for two hours, and the students are invited to come down. And um, she does a session with all ages. So usually they start off with something fun that um, that can be adapted to any age child that comes in. And then she also provides services for children at their grade level. And then in the afternoon, she's getting kids and help them get enrolled in um, homebound services. And she also helps um, with tutoring sessions to make sure they stay caught up in their schoolwork. Um, in order to be a school teacher at the Children's Hospital of Michigan, you have to have a bachelor's degree in education, be certified through the state of Michigan, and have at least one or two years of teaching experience in a school or other setting. Um, and they can also hold other specialty certificates, and many of our um, teachers have special ed certification. And then we also have music therapists. So what we try to do is make the hospital as much as normal and as fun as possible. When I go in to meet the children and families in the hospital, I tell them, I'm in charge of the toys, and I'm in charge of fun, and I'm here to try to make you a little happier than you are right now. And I work in intensive care, so it's not too hard to make it like at least this much happier because it's really hard just being there. But our music therapists use music to facilitate their fun, and they um, also help with pain by using teaching relaxation skills, sometimes just coming in and strumming a little bit on a guitar, teaching a, a new parent in the neonatal intensive care unit how to hum for their baby. Even though maybe they can't hold their baby yet, they can hum and they can comfort the baby that way. Then they do lots of things with motor skills. They can help enhance communication, lots of emotional expression. We have lots of drums to help these kids bang out anything they need to bang out on a drum. And then we also do um, end-of-life support, helping families maybe write a, a legacy song for their, their um, loved one. And then we have um, music groups that happen in the mornings. On Tuesday, we have all-ages music group. And then um, we also have infant-toddler music group. And the music therapists have to have a bachelor's degree in music therapy. They need 1,200 clinical hours for their practicum and internship, and they have to be certified through the American Music Therapy Association. And we also have art therapists. So we have our art therapists we've had for two and a half years. Music therapy we've had about 10, I think, um, and, and they're full-time. Our art therapist just started two and a half years ago, and she's part-time. So she works primarily with the kids that are on dialysis who come in. They have to come in three times a week, sit in a chair, get hooked up to a machine. So she's finding very creative ways to help them um, get through their dialysis session. And you can see they did remote control cars with paint one day. They made masks. She helps them do all kinds of scrapbooking and things that um, help them, you know, really express who they are and what they're going through. Our art therapists have to have a master's degree in art therapy. They have to have 700 clinical training hours for their practicum and internship, and they have, have to also be certified through their association. Child life. So um, these are some interventions that we do to help children in the hospital. We prepare them for any tested procedure that they're having. And you can see this is our little medical play doll. So they get to be the doctor or the nurse. They get to draw the face on it, so that right away tells us how they're feeling or how they're doing with their hospitalization. And then we use real equipment, real needles, real, um, um, we call them rubber bands, but they're tourniquets, um, to get teach them how they're going to get through this procedure. And in the midst of that, I'm teaching them um, coping skills. Do you want to watch or do you want to look at something else? And if they want to look at something else, I have this whole bag, I call it my bag of tricks. And there is an iPad in there. It's not my favorite tool to use, but it does work like magic a lot. Um, but I also have like little lights that light up. I have um, rattles for babies. I have rain sticks. Just anything and anything that a child would want to help take their mind off of what's going on. And sometimes we just talk. And one of my favorite subjects is school. So what grade are you in? And what's your favorite subject? And, you know, things like that, just to get their mind off of the procedure. Um, we do non-farm pain management, so as well as doing it during the procedure, we'll do it if a child's in pain, say post-surgery, or even if they're just having um, like a sickle cell pain crisis, we find things to do to help take their mind off the pain. Sometimes it's as simple as reading to a child or providing books to the parents to read to them. Um, it can also be um, guided imagery or relaxation sessions that we use. And then therapeutic play. We use play as a tool to help get to know the children, but actually help them cope 
and um, just be a normal kid through their hospitalization. Emotional support, we're always validating their feelings. It's not fear to be here. You have every right to feel angry or sad or scared. And I talk to them, too, about how their parents are feeling. It's not just the kids who are having these feelings. You know, the parents, too, are, you know, wondering, oh, are they going to be okay? What's happening next? You know, just help them through all of that. And then I do um, lots of sibling support. I help the siblings make a visit to the bedside by preparing them step by step what they're going to see when they get there. I have a little book of machines, and then I take pictures of the patient so they know what to, they're going to see when they get to the room. And then I also provide bereavement support when a child has died to help children understand what does dead mean, what does it look like, what are they going to see, make sure they know they didn't cause it, um, and uh, they're not going to catch it. That's the only thing they worry about. So we do support through the whole lifespan. And these are just some pictures of some of the things we did. This is Halloween, so we get lots of donations all year long, not just at Snowpile, but all year. So um, we have um, Halloween costumes donated at Halloween. These are some of our um, educational books we use to teach children about their diagnosis. Um, you can see there's a family celebrating Thanksgiving. There's a medical play outside on the mall. We had a family picnic every summer. And then um, this little girl is using um, deep breathing and distraction at the same time to help her get through a, a, a test. And then this is another diagnosis teaching. And then that big thing up there with the lights and the colors, that's one of our um, relaxation stations, and it actually helps reduce pain. Just by taking the focus off of what's going on, the child can change the colors on it, they can make it bubble more, and those, these are fiber optic, I call it spaghetti, but it's just fiber optic tubes that lay across the bed. So child life specialists have to have at least a bachelor's degree in child life or a related field. Mine happens to be in elementary education. We have to have at least 10 core courses in child development because we're child development experts. We need to know from birth all the way through the lifespan how children are reacting to what's going on and how we can explain to them what's going on in the hospital. Um, we have to... We can do a practicum, but that's optional at this point. We have to do an internship of at least 480 hours. We offer an internship at Children's at 600 hours. Um, and then we have to get certified by our certifying body. And Oh, and the practicum is 120 hours. It's 10 hours um, a week for 12 weeks. They have to have, you have to have at least 60 credit hours to apply for the child life practicum. And the practicum is um, a good way for students to find out if the hospital is really the place they want to work. So if you have a student who's saying, you know, I think I want to go into teaching, but the classroom doesn't seem to fit me well, and that's kind of like where I was. I knew I wanted to be a child life specialist when I was getting my teaching degree, but I knew I didn't like staying in my room, and I didn't like the routine as much. And I work in the ICU where there is no routine, and I don't stay in any room for more than probably 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour at a time. So if you have students who are exploring and they're not um, sure you know, if, what they want to do, please um, refer them to us. And they can start out by volunteering in the hospital because we want to make sure it's a good fit that they're comfortable being in the hospital. And then the practicum is just a way to find out if child life is a good fit for them. Um, we usually take one practicum student each semester. They have to do a final project, and they get to shadow every child life specialist in the hospital, so they get to see all the units and experience lots of things. And then our internship is 600 hours. It's 40 hours a week for 15 weeks. And we have um, an application process that is we follow through the Child Life Council. Um, so, if, again, if you have students interested, you would want to direct them to the Child Life Council website, and they would find out more about um, becoming a child life specialist. So, special events and then the playroom. Um, so, we do have a large staff in the hospital. Um, just, just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, the hospital pays all of our salaries type of thing, but all of the supplies and equipment we use in our playrooms for our special events, for one-on-one -on -one individual sessions with the um, patients is all donated through our Children's Hospital of Michigan Foundation. So um, we seek support from the community quite a bit. And um, I, f I feel very lucky. I feel like I have the best job in the whole place because I talk with people every day that want to do something good, whether it be a Girl Scout troop wanting to donate blankets or um, you know, someone wanting to come in and throw a party for the kids in the activity center. So there's all different ways that people can help. Um, 
but um, special events in the playroom. So we do have a variety of special events. We have small groups that come into the activity center to host parties. We have meet and greets, like we just had four Lions players come um, to visit the kids in the activity center. We call it a meet and greet. The kids come in, we take a photo. Um, they get a little autograph and you know get to talk to the players and things. Those are always fun. Then we have lots of reoccurring groups. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, I think, on another slide. <laughs> But um, we host a variety of different holiday events, as I talked about a little earlier. The kids should be participating in those normal activities that they would if they were in school and things. And that's what we try to do. Like at Valentine's Day, we do a card exchange. Um, and that's all donation-based. I get these beautiful handmade cards um, by crafters. And um, we make those available to all the staff in the hospital. So whenever they enter a patient's room, they get a Valentine card, like you would in an exchange at school. That's a big deal for kids, more than you and I might realize, um, but it is a big deal for those kids to be acknowledged. Happy Valentine's Day for, from every staff member that walks in their room. It could be, you know, our environmental services lady. It could be the lady that's serving the food from dietary. It could be the doctor. But we make those cards available on Valentine's Day so they feel nice and popular and uh, they're receiving some cards. Halloween, we do trick-or-treating, which um, our picture before showed you our little our little fairy butterfly in her wagon going around trick or treating, but um, we pass out costumes to all the kids. They all get to have costumes on, um, and then in the afternoon we trick or treat from like the offices around um, the inpatient floors. So it's a lot of fun, um, and the kids really. That's my favorite day. <laughs> I love Halloween. Um, but we have no candy. Yeah, no candy. So I come back and ask to the ICU patients, and usually it's the cancer, and I said there's no candy in here, but there's a lot of good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all trinkets, little slinkies, little you know, pencils and pads of paper and word search puzzle books and things like that. Um, then we have Camp Wish You Well We try to, in the summertime, run a camp, kind of a themed week, um, where the kids feel like they're camping. This year we did do an outdoorsy type of theme. Last year we did a circus theme. We try to theme it and just make it special. It's a special week and every day is tied in and it's, it's, it's fun for the kids too, as well as the staff. We like it too. And then we have Snow Pile and that's our annual holiday gift giving event, um, which we're here to talk to you about today. Um, I guess I'll flip back and forth. So this is kind of what Snow Pile looks like. Um, we we collect lots of toys. I just looked back at our um, statistics, and last year we gave around almost 500 toys away to the kids, and that's just the toys. There's more, <laughs> let me tell you. So, um, but it is a snow pile is a one-day event, but we collect donations beginning at the, you know at the beginning of the month in December. We try to collect as much as we can, and we basically set up a store. It's all donation based. Um, we transform our boardrooms where um, all the meetings happen throughout the year um, into a store. So we decorate and we fill the tables with, with things. Um, we also use another part of the, the hospital, like uh, this is a different room. This is like our stuffed animal room. Do I have a book picture? We have books. Um, so I'll let you know. The kids are, are walking away with a lot of gifts, the family members. Um, Come and shop. Where am I? So a family member is invited down to quote unquote shop, and it's a very personal experience. We um, use about 150 volunteers that day um, in three different shifts, plus our entire staff, plus a few other staff members, key staff members um, throughout the hospital. Our librarians very involved in the book aspect. Our volunteer coordinators very involved in our volunteer um, aspect of it. So. Um, it takes a lot of people to put on this one-day event, um, but family members are invited down personally to shop. They get to, to go through. Um, we have the DSO comes and, and plays some music for us, um, for the families while they're shopping and while they're having snacks and things. But So they shop, then they drop their gifts off. The gifts get wrapped, and that's when they have refreshments. The family members are able to sit down and just relax. So it's almost a gift to them as well, not just to the patients, right? And their brothers and sisters also benefit. But um, they get to relax for a minute, have some snacks, um, listen to the DSO and Sphinx, um, play some music for them. And then they're escorted back up to their room with their gifts all wrapped and ready to go. Um, it is for inpatients only. Um, 
And we today in the hospital have 213 kids in the hospital. So um, it's a pretty big event, and it's not just for the brothers, and, or not just for the patients. We also service the brothers and sisters. So um, when a family member comes down to shop, they get to choose gifts. Like um, it's it's so hard to explain. It's 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 a lovely big event. Um, I wish you could see it in action. But so these are like the gifts. The toys are the gifts. So a patient will get three gifts, but the patient also gets a game, a stuffed animal, a book, a puzzle. Um, and then we have our lovely pillowcase. pillowcase lady. We have a lovely lady who makes um, handmade beautiful pillowcases for the kids um, through another organization, but she gives them a pillowcase. And so that's what the patients get. The brothers and sisters get one gift, one toy, but they also get a game, a book, a stuffed animal, a puzzle. Um, and then the family gets to choose a holiday book. We have a lovely organization that donates um, 250 holiday books for us a variety of different holiday books. So the family will walk away with a holiday book of whatever holiday they choose or celebrate, and then a DVD. So we just added that. So every year, depending on what we get donated, um, last year we were able to add the, the DVD thing as an addition for the family to, to you know, have a family movie <coughs> night or something like that. So um, Snow Pile is lovely. (laughs) And um, it's a lot to coordinate and things like that, but it is a grand, wonderful event. Um, We had uh, one gentleman a couple of years ago, uh, he's a dad, and we were going around inviting um, to the event, and the dad said, I'm going to pass. I want this to go to families who need it. I I have the financial means. I can get gifts for my family. Um, I'm going to pass. So we go around and we invite twice. And the second time we went around and we said, Dad, one of the volunteers actually, one of our wonderful hospital volunteers, said, you know, Dad, we know you have the money. We know that you can afford the gifts. That's not what this is about. When you have a child in the hospital, it's stressful enough. But during the, hosp- during the holiday season, do you have the time? Do you have the energy? Do you have, you know, just the wherewithal? Can you get yourself out there? to go shopping when you want to be with your child here in the hospital and you have kids at home and you're just so, you know, stressed. I mean, it's stressful having a child in the hospital, like I said, no matter what time of year it is. But at the holiday time, we all feel extra stress, right? So these families that are in the hospital at the holiday time feel it even more so, right? So um, that gentleman has made such an impact on me, and I have looked at Snowpile a completely different way ever since I met him. Um, but he broke this big gentleman, big, like, gentleman, dad, you know, strong, young guy, broke down in tears, in tears. Finally agreed to come to Snowpile. Came down and saw the event itself, because just that, just walking into this room, like, these pictures don't do it justice. Um, he broke down in tears again. Like he, you know, he broke down in tears to accept it. But then when he saw, you know, he was, it was, it was, it changed Snowpile for me. And I had been, I've done it eight years. This will be my ninth year. Um, and this was just a couple of years ago. I mean, three years ago, I think I met this gentleman. And now I look at Snowpile completely different um, because of his reaction. And um, we do, uh, you know, every year, it, it, it's amazing to me, and actually this is, I'm all about process improvement. I do events, and every year I'm like, what can I do to make this better? And one, one staff person gave me comments. You know, we always ask for everybody to give comments, and they're like, please have tissue at the check-in desk. <laughs> please have tissue. So two years ago, we added tissue at the check-in desk. Um, because these moms and dads, they walk in, and they just really are overwhelmed. Um, and uh, it's not something we could do for these families without community support, without volunteer support. I mean, it takes a lot to put this on. I'm kind of in charge of it. That means nothing. I couldn't do it, you know, by myself. I need, you know, the people who support it. And I am here to tell you that we are a lovely community. And every year, this you know, lovely event comes together, and I've seen it grow over the last nine years. I mean, it's it's amazing. Last year, we were able to do the number of gifts I told you. Um, This year, I hope it's more. You know what I mean? Um, And when we first started, we were giving just, you know, a gift and a stuffed animal and a book, and it's just continued to grow, and it's just become an amazing, wonderful event. 
Um, last year we gave around 500 toys that was or, or kids, 500 kids we gave away. So, you know, times that by it was 190. I just looked at the, the stats before I came over. 191 patients, 276 um, brothers and sisters all benefited from from the event. So. And even the, it's an event, but what happens the rest of the week, like the week between Snow Pile until the holidays are over, we each get a cart on our unit. It's a laundry cart, a big, huge laundry cart full of toys for all ages. And every child that's admitted between in those two weeks gets a bag full of toys. So, you you know, sometimes families, we find them trying to get admitted on Snow Pile Day and trying to figure out how to take Snow Pile Day. And my kid has a fever because, you know, last year I know I was here on that magic day. So, uh, so we, we do change the date. Yeah, we, <laughs> we change the date um, every year, so we, we mix it up a little bit. But um, some of our kids, unfortunately, that come to the hospital regularly because they have a diagnosis that brings them back multiple times throughout the year, they do eventually benefit from snow pile, you know, and they eventually start to learn about it. But it is a grand event, and they, they do appreciate it. But, yeah, that is the nice part. So we do collect all these wonderful donations for the event. Um, but uh, as donations continue to come in after the event, we um, – we supply the, the units with, with toys and games and stuffed animals and books um, for the patients that are admitted throughout that week of, of the Christmas holiday, right? But it's Hanukkah, it's Kwanzaa, it's all of those things. And sometimes we'll have enough donations to even take us through to the new year. So um, it, it's, it's a nice event and it reaches a lot of other kids. So the statistics I gave you were the di event day. Mm -hmm. um, but those gifts continue to give afterwards. Um, so whatever wasn't um, chosen in Snowpile goes up to the units for the children admitted after the event. So um, it, it's a great, grand event. It's an awesome day. Yep. And so volunteers, um, I mentioned we use about 150 volunteers <laughs> the day of Snowpile in three different shifts. Um, it takes a lot of people to, to coordinate and organize uh, all of those toys. And like I said, it's a very personal event. We have personal shoppers. We have personal escorts. We have people working in the hospitality area. Um, we have people wrapping gifts. We have people um, playing music, right? We have all kinds of, of things going on. So, um, but so part of the hospital, we do have a volunteer services department. Our manager actually oversees the child life department as well as the volunteer services department. Um, there's opportunities for volunteers, um, students, faculty. We, we love to have all kinds of folks. Um, everybody brings their own um, expertise and can do lots of different things to help us out. But um, most of our volunteers work in the playrooms and do bedside visits, like one-on-one -on -one with the children who can't come to the activity center. Um, we have an arts and crafts cart that goes room to room to help the kids you know, keep busy. Um, that's kind of the best gift you can give children sometimes is giving them something to do when they're in the hospital because there is a lot of down, boring time, and we prefer to turn the TV off, turn the video games off, and give them something to do. It helps distract them from their pain. It help, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a gift to give them something to do. So arts and crafts cart. We have the hospitality cart. So um, we do have volunteers that go around and serve coffee and donuts and cookies and you know crackers to the families. Um, we have a library, an inpatient library, that operates just like any other library. They check out books and movies and magazines. Um, so our storytelling volunteers kind of work with our librarian through that. We have a big pet therapy program, which is awesome. We have dogs that come to visit the kids, and um, that's an amazing thing to see. Um, we have the dialysis area that um, really can require some specialized attention because those kids are not really inpatient, but they're here. They're at the hospital um, three times a week for four or five hours at a time. They're missing a lot of school. Um, they miss a lot of socialization time with their friends because they're spending so much time with us. Um, oh, I mentioned our library. We have our surgical pre-op. We have a couple different playrooms, um, inpatient playrooms, but we also have a surgery playroom. So the kids, and that's amazing because <laughs> how cool is that? You know, like right if you've ever had surgery, you're sitting in the waiting room just waiting or waiting for your blood work or something, you know. But at, at children's, you see kids playing and they're not thinking about their surgery. And, and so that playroom is very beneficial to those kids. 
we have a video game techie cart, so we try to get our, our techie, techie young people to, to go around room to room, kind of like the arts and crafts, but do it with video games and check those in and out. There are some clerical duties and lots more. Special events help. I like to get some volunteers to help me with special events. So, um, But so to be a volunteer at the hospital, um, it's an eight-month commitment for 100 hours. Um, three hours per week is generally what we like to have you on a schedule, and it's usually like every Wednesday evening or every Tuesday morning, something like that. There's an interview process, so it really is a good experience for students, I think. Um, they do have to go through an interview process. It's more of a group interview than a one-on-one, -on -one, but um, there's a background check. There's um, net learning modules that we as staff have to do at the hospital. There are certain ones that are identified for um, volunteers to do, too. Um, so it's learning about hospital codes and infection control and all of those things. Um, then there's uh, medical clearance. They have to make sure they have their flu shot, a TB test. You know, there's, there's some things that go into volunteering in the hospital, um, more so than maybe other places. There's an orientation, and then we have a mentoring kind of training process to make people feel comfortable when they're in the hospital setting because it can be intimidating if you're not used to it. Other volunteer opportunities, we have small group volunteer opportunities in the activity center. So like I just had Coca-Cola HR. They wanted to come in and do some activities. It was great. They gave little giveaways to the kids. Um, had a group a couple weeks ago throw a pirate party, which was lots of fun. Um, they all were wearing bandanas and eye patches, and they had to talk like a pirate sheet. Everybody, when you walked in the room, everybody, Arr. Um, You know, so, so it helps the kids in, in so many ways to, to throw little parties like that. Um, they forget they're in the hospital. They're having fun with their, you know, other buddies that are in the hospital with them. Um, so those are like a one-time group opportunity. We have lots of reoccurring groups, and a lot of them are from Wayne State, <laughs> believe it or not. Well, it's, it's not that hard to believe. We have a really nice relationship with the student um, programs here. So uh, the Pediatric Interest Group, which is a medical student group, um, they come and they run Wheel of Fortune on Thursday nights for us. And um, the kids play Wheel of Fortune, they win prizes, and the students run it all. Um, that's kind of our reoccurrent groups are champion programs. So there are like the the board of the PIG, we call it PIG, Pediatric Interest Group. The board members of that student group have gone through to become a hospital trained volunteer. They went through that whole process. And then because they're a trained hospital volunteer, they can bring other volunteers in and kind of supervise them in the activity center while they're there. So that's how Wheel of Fortune runs. Um, the champions kind of rotate to supervise the other students, and it's lovely. It's every Thursday night during the school year. Um, we have ARI, and I apologize. I tried to look. I don't even know what ARI stands for, but it has been a group that was here before me in this department, so I know it's been running for over eight or nine years. I don't know what ARIE stands for, but it is medical students, and they kind of meet together with the, the pediatric interest group. But they come every Saturday, and they do crafts with the kids at the activity center, so... Um, that's a great group. We have a music and medicine um, group from Wayne State that comes and plays music in the lobby, and it changes the environment like you wouldn't believe. The lobby is, um, am I? Oh, do I have to stop talking? I could talk forever. Um, I could talk forever about stuff like this. Um, so uh, music and medicine comes, and they play music in the lobby, um, usually once a week, sometimes twice a week, maybe they, you know, depending on their schedule. But that's all medical students as well. So because we have a good relationship with the medical school, we, um, we seem to have a lot of medical student groups, and we love it. I have other one-timers um, that come uh, from Wayne State. Lots of different uh, student groups call us. And then service projects. I get calls from, like, the Girl Scouts, and they can't come in to volunteer because they're younger, infection control, privacy confidentiality issues. But they'll, you know, I have a service project idea list that I share with them. And much larger groups um, can do those things, too. Um, in our activity centers, we can only have about four or five people come in because they're so small. But so if it's a large group of 30 people, um, I give them the, the service project idea list, and it's making fleece-type blankets, making activity packets, all things that benefit the patients and families in, in some way. So um, we'd love to have volunteers and help from the community. Um, so, okay. Any questions about snow pile, volunteering, child life? I do have a question uh, regarding volunteers for high school students. Is, is that a possibility? We do have um, a, a program in
in the summer for 15 to 18 year olds. They can come in um, and they're working with kids in the clinic waiting rooms, reading to them while they're in the waiting rooms waiting. Um, they don't really have an inpatient type of experience. Um, and then some of the other teens will um, escort family members around. Um, so we do have a, a small teen program that goes from June to August. We usually accept applications starting in March and then do interviews in April and May, and then they start in June. Anything else? Thank you all for your time. So according to the agenda, I'm supposed to talk about service, but I know a lot of you have to get back at one. And we'll and what we're really here for is this uh, program right here. So maybe we can switch things. Cheryl, do you want to talk about how people can get involved? And then I'll run over the boring importance of service stuff. You sure? I mean, we all don't. Okay. That's okay. I can close it up for you. Okay, yeah, and I'll pop that up for you, too. All right, so I'll do this real quick. If you guys have any questions or anything, you can definitely ask. understand the different categories. Okay. Um, so service, service is something that we all have to do, and like I said, I'll try to run this really quick so we can talk about the Snow Powell program, but service is something that we all have to do as part of our, our position, I guess you can say. It's considered when we do uh, ESS or promotion, um, but also it's just something good that we should all do as human beings. Uh, there was a study done before that they gave $20 to everybody. One people had to spend it on themselves. Another group had to spend $10 on somebody else and $10 on themselves and then rate their happiness. The group that spent $10 on somebody else always rated at a higher number. So it definitely benefits you and it benefits other people. A service is one-seventh of your evaluation, like I mentioned, when it comes to ESS and promotion. Uh, it's just a great way to feel better about yourself and your life. Uh, factors for service are community, uh, service to university, and professional service. Uh-oh. There we go. Service is one-seventh of your evaluation. Uh, kind of things I just said. And then uh, factors for service. Service to the community, university, and professional service. These are things that you can count towards your service. Uh, service to the community can mean a lot of different things. And I know, at least for myself, I'm semi-new. Uh, this can be kind of confusing. What qualifies as service? What qualifies as something else? Uh, so we can have a Q&A after this, probably after Cheryl speaks, to kind of define that. But there are some examples. I don't know if you guys know Emil. Um, he's the chemistry guy. That's how I think of him. But uh, he does a like, chemistry demonstration, I think, at Cranbrook, just for students. And I think that would qualify as service for the community. There's also other things, like memberships. Uh, you can be a consultant or give uh, testimony, I guess, to different community groups. Just, I guess, providing your own services to your surrounding community. Uh, service to the, to the university, well, which is this, like serving on a committee uh, definitely is one of those things. Uh, coming to these events, I believe, could, you can count as part of your service. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do to do this. And also what I found out is it can be department to department or college to college. Typically, like you've probably heard before, if there is someone who has been doing this a little bit longer than you, there's probably a good resource to let you know and kind of help you differentiate what counts as service and what maybe counts as something else towards your professional development. Uh, and again, just professional service. Uh, my background, I have a master's in counseling, so the ACA, American Counseling Association, is something that I could, I could participate in and count towards my service towards the, my professional service, I guess you could say. Uh, Mia Kata is a common one that I've seen other individuals at that conference that can also count towards your professional service. Uh, evaluation of service, and again, this is something that I found out can differ from college to college or the department to department. Um, but as the, I think it's the provost, lays it out, this is how they group you. Uh, I kind of think of it, I mean, everybody can kind of think of it the way they want. But group one is like you've done the best, group two is you've done mediocre, and group three, maybe you need to work on some things. Obviously, there's more, I don't know if it's legal jargon, but technical jargon to define it. Uh, but that's pretty much how they break it down in group one, group two, and group three. Obviously, you want to be group one. That helps you out in a lot of different areas. For one thing, again, as a human to society, but also in your professional career, both in ESS and gaining promotion. And again, I know we're short on time. 
Uh, maybe we can hold on questions, because uh, Cheryl's going to answer these questions anyways. Uh, but Cheryl, Cheryl can talk about uh, the snow pile and what we're doing to help out that program. Good afternoon, everyone. My colleagues on the ASSC didn't exactly introduce themselves. So first, Marianka Holloway is our co-chair. I'm the chair this year. Dennis is noted on the uh, agenda as the secretary. Just to <laughs> clarify a couple of things that Dennis just mentioned, uh, coming to events like this is considered professional development because you attended a professional development workshop. Service on a professional development, say, just to mention me a kind of like, I've been active with MCPA, which is the Michigan College Personnel Association. I've served as a board member. I've served as past president. Those would be examples of service to a professional organization. Again, but uh, if you decide to volunteer at Snowpile or something else like that, that would be considered community service. As far as the factors, each department or each division has their own factors. So when you are submitting your selective salary documents, your selective salary committee will be determining whether you're in group one, two, or three based on the factors of your unit. And some of our other seasoned academic staff, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. So now, the purpose today, again, Snowpile is our <laughs> feature service organization for this year. I'm going to pass around a flyer. It's two-sided. Uh, it really summarizes. Oh, oh, you already have some. Does everyone have some? No, no. Okay. It summarizes uh, the presentation today. But also on the back, it lists some of the suggested donations that they are seeking. And so, if at all possible, try to adhere to what they're looking for, because as our presenter said, they're looking for to make sure that they're covering all uh, age ranges. Uh, we do have building volunteers who will be accepting donations. If you are here, please stand and introduce yourself so people will know who you are. I think I saw. I'm Marianta Holloway, and I'm a volunteer for Bayer. I'm Kristen Terry, and I'm a volunteer for Winter along with Jeffrey Wright. <coughs> Nicole Field, a pretty crusty library. <coughs> Tiana Choco, Nadulian, Chancellor at Cunningham Biological Sciences Building. Sarah Doyle, a social worker with the Housing Board. Uh, Dennis Westy, uh, Cone Building. And I'm volunteering. I'm located in the Maccabees building, which is in close proximity to the Welcome Center. So the Welcome Center people just come on over next door. And the same thing with the College of Ed. We're really close. So College of Ed, I don't think we were able no, to. We, no, we do have a volunteer for the College of Ed. She's it. not. There are some people who were not able to come today. Okay. So, uh, but, you know, even if you work in that building, it doesn't necessarily, if you're, just make sure you donate. We will have donation boxes set aside. They're kind of against the wall right now. But we will have those with one of the flyers uh, on the side. I do like, would like to thank in her absence, it was Stacy Moser, our member at large, who brought this. She was not able to be here today. She had to be out of town. But uh, she was the one who brought this program to our attention, and we always like to be out in the community. And after she was talking about it, I realized when my son was a year and a half, uh, one year, yeah, year and a half, he was in Children's Hospital right at Christmas. And yes, he came home with a whole bunch of toys. <laughs> He's 25 now, but uh, so now I realize he was a recipient of this program, of course. We didn't know the name, so it's been around. It may not have actually been called Snowpile back then, but this type of program has been in existence for quite a while. Any other questions? Uh, our president, our union president is here, Charlie Prears. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> Okay. And uh, Mark. Hi, folks. I'm uh, uh, the new organizer for the union to uh, help make it Mark. stronger. Come over, so And um, <laughs> I've been working with folks uh, in setting up. It's great that you're here. Going to go talk to your colleagues. Uh, we're going to send out flyers and everything like that. But in addition to that, I've been signing up people to go out with me uh, for these few days, uh, 12 days or so, uh, 
to actually around lunchtime between 11 and 1, whatever time folks have, to actually go and put a personal face and a personal ask, uh, to go talk to folks in an area. And so please come up to me afterwards and talk to me about uh, figuring out a time where we can set that up to, to help build the strength of this program. So thank you very much. Uh, it's, and she said she just has to bring tissues now to, to the thing. And I was like, you got to bring tissues to presentations, too. So I was like, I don't want to go in Okay. Dennis, uh, did you have anything? Yes. What is the deadline for donating? Uh, it's December 11th. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, we were supposed question. to mention that at some point. Yeah, I think it was at the beginning somehow, but yeah, we neglected to put that on the flyer, but thank you. And spread that to your colleagues. We do have some extras of these, so uh, as you uh, leave out, if you want to pick up a couple more, feel free to do so. Any other questions? Well, thank you again for coming. Please fill out the evaluation form. That's the blue sheet. And you can just leave it up here at the front on your way out. Also, next month, we will not have a luncheon, but we will have a... Holiday networking. It will be on December 17th, I believe. That is a Thursday again, but that is four to six at the Maccabees restaurant in the Maccabees building. So come on out and just enjoy and relax for the holidays.